Welcome to a Texas Heart Institute educational series on innovative technologies and techniques uh, featuring science in treatment of cerebrovascular disease. I'm your host. My name is Varmer Kreja. I'm an international cardiologist at Texas Heart Institute and CHI Health Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center in Houston, Texas. Joining me today is Dr. Miguel Montero Baker. He is an associate professor of vascular surgery at Baylor College of Medicine and also divisional chief of vascular surgery at Baylor St. Luke's Hospital in Houston, Texas. Also joining us today, a special guest, Dr. Gary Rubin. Dr. Gary Rubin is a world-renowned interventional cardiologist recognized for his groundbreaking work in development of the first FDA-approved coronary stent, as well as in pioneering the techniques of carotid artery stenting and embolic protection devices. Dr. Rubin has published more than 250 manuscripts in peer-reviewed journals and as many abstracts also in journals. He has also edited three textbooks and contributed to other textbooks as well. In his 30 plus year career, he has uh, uh, gained a tremendous reputation uh, in the field of cardiac care and particularly in the field of uh, coronary interventions and uh, carotid artery interventions. Dr. Gary Rubin is currently the medical director at Cardiovascular Associates of Southeast in Birmingham, Alabama. Welcome, Gary. Thank you. So Gary, I would like to ask you, with your tremendous experience, uh, 25 plus years in performing carotid artery interventions, what does a typical scenario of carotid intervention in your hands look like? Thank you, Dr. Kreiser. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, carotid artery stenting was developed almost 20 years ago now in an effort to um, minimize the invasive requirements for treating carotid stenosis since they are one of the important causes of stroke in our patients. We began by uh, trying to figure out how we could do this uh, with percutaneous techniques that we'd used in the heart. Uh, and as it evolved over the years, now decades, uh, we have been able to develop a technique that requires uh, very little time in the interventional suite. It does not require general anesthesia. Uh, the patient is awake or can be completely awake during the procedure is done under local anesthesia. And uh, it's a technique that we have tested now rigorously in many prospective randomized trials against our uh, competitor, which would be the standard technique of endarterectomy surgery. And we have been able to show that this is a safe and effective technique for treating carotid stenosis. Thank you, Gary. Uh, as you have mentioned, uh, in the last several decades, significant progress has been made in endovascular treatment of cerebrovascular disease. Dr. Miguel Montero Baker, can you uh, summarize for us what progress has been made in technology, techniques, and patient selection for carotid artery stenting? Of course, Dr. Kreischer. I think that when we look at where <laughs> we were and how it's uh, evolved slowly over time, we definitely came from a rather uh, imperfect stance to uh, really smoothing out all the uh, te technical needs that, that we required. So there's been a very uh, interesting evolution on just the catheters, the material of the catheters, the tips of the catheters to make them as less abrasive as possible. A lot of effort and a lot of investigation has been put on how can we avoid some of those particles going to the brain. So all the embolic protection be that distal or proximal embolic protections, that has evolved flourishly. And then I think stents themselves, the technology that we're using at the implant, be that open cell, closed cell, hybrid cells, I think all have been uh, adding more and more to the safety of this procedure. 
Another very important thing is that we've understood that a lot of what happens when somebody's trying to maneuver their way from the bottom all the way up to the carotid is it's a treacherous path. So we've understood a lot more about what adequate anatomy we need, what could be a high risk patient for carotid artery stenting, what could be a low risk patient, what type of curvatures would you need? And all of that has been now obviously added to advancement in, in perioperative imaging. I mean, we have now more information than we have ever had in the past leading to the safety that we have now with, as uh, Dr. Rubin mentioned, many of the studies published. Excellent, thank you, Miguel, for this uh, update. Uh, now, uh, we're moving to the segment of this presentation that um, uh, talks about science in uh, carotid uh, artery disease and treatment of carotid artery disease. There are uh, a lot of skeptics, disbelievers, and critics of uh, advances uh, in carotid artery interventions, what Miguel has just mentioned, and uh, these believers that we have made a significant progress. So, uh, Gary, I would like for you to uh, summarize to us the results of um, these clinical trials that have validated carotid artery stenting, and uh, ask, answer maybe why is there still a dispute among societies? And, uh, different individuals that promote one treatment or the other, and a lack of acceptance from payers for carotid artery stenting as a reasonable alternative to a carotid endarterectomy for certain subset of patients. That's a great question. Thank you, Dr. Kreiser. And I think we can look at the science. And there have been now two, three, four uh, studies that have been published uh, two and one combined meta-analysis in the New England Journal of Medicine, very reputable journal, peer-reviewed journal, that has uh, illustrated the scientific rigor that we have subjected coronary artery stenting to in attempting to validate this against the uh, standard of care, which was carotid endarterectomy. So there was the CREST-1 trial that was uh, begun about uh, 14 years ago now, then there was the ACT-1 study, which looked at asymptomatic patients. That was uh, launched about uh, seven or eight years ago. We have now have 10-year outcome data from these studies. So what we have here is rigorous scientific data. So there is opinion, there is commentary, there is bias, but uh, we need to turn, as, we're, as we are now in this era of COVID-19, to the best science and the best advice from the scientists who have done the work to randomize patients in these prospective trials, to screen them carefully to make sure we are comparing apples to apples, not apples to oranges, to make sure that the follow-up is not biased, that we're measuring the endpoints with great rigor. And that's what we've done. In fact, uh, carotid artery stenting has been one of the most carefully studied medical procedures at this time, probably only second to coronary intervention. And I'm delighted to show you now some of the results. And the, the bottom line is that no matter how you look at this, that the outcomes, the primary outcomes in all of these trials, where we looked at stroke, death, we looked at myocardial infarction complicating the procedure, and we looked at the incidence of stroke out to four and then to 10 years. And as you see from these slides, let's go to the next one. And you can go to the next one that we have in these rigorous prospective apple to apple uh, comparisons uh, demonstrated that carotid artery stenting in terms of stroke prevention is equivalent to uh, carotid endarterectomy surgery. So this resulted in independent uh, uh, statement, an independent statement from the National Institutes of Neurological Disorders and Stroke. Uh, scientists, neurologists, without any, as we say, dog in the hunt, to declare that these trials have shown that surgery and stenting are equally safe and effective. 
Now, there are a couple of caveats to this, and that is that in the earliest of these trials, as Dr. Montero Baker so rightly pointed out, we didn't quite understand the best patients to be treating with stenting. And so the results of generally minor strokes, neurological events, were a little bit advantageous for surgery. But over time, both were very effective in preventing stroke. And I am uh, quick to add that uh, we will discuss data later in this discussion that shows that the outcomes in 2020 compared to 2003 are very different. And therefore, uh, outcomes have significantly improved. And I would also add that what is not shown on those slides are the operative complications from surgery. And they were not insignificant. There was approximately 5% of the patients had damage to the cranial nerves with the neck surgery. And so this is uh, a secondary endpoint that was studied in these trials. So the, the bottom line here is simply that this much less invasive much less painful uh, percutaneous procedure has been shown in terms of stroke prevention to be as safe and efficacious as endorectomy. So that's where we stand today, and, and uh, that is what the rigorous science has shown us. Dr. Rubin, let me uh, interject for a second and, and ask you, you've obviously been part of this uh, from the very beginning. With such amount of effort and, and, and energy put into CREST-1, what was really the driver for CREST-2 and what was its uniqueness and the necessity for it to exist? That's a wonderful question. And, uh, and let me address it because it's very important. Over the decades that we have been using, firstly, endarterectomy, and secondly, carotid stenting to take care of these blockages, there have been significant advances in medical management of patients with these blockages. Now, there have been trials in the past uh, that demonstrated that it was better to remove the blockage with surgery than to use simple medications. But the medications back now 10, 20 years ago were not the medications that we have access to today. And so it is extremely important that we turn now back and answer the question again. Can we now prove that removing the blockage with either stenting or surgery is still superior to medical therapy? I would uh, then move on to this major CREST 2 trial. I was part of the planning committee. I am on the executive committee. I've been credentialing operators. As we planned this trial, it was very clear that the unknown, that the test treatment was going to be medical therapy. And the medical therapy we are using is truly state of the art. That is targeted medical therapy, looking at targeted reductions of blood pressure, of LDLC cholesterol, of hemoglobin A1C for diabetes, for smoking cessation, for weight reduction, for improvements in nutrition. So this is really five-star medical therapy, and we are now comparing endarterectomy and stenting against this best, best medical therapy. And it needs to be said that both endarterectomy and stenting have become safer, uh, again, over these last 10 or 15 years we're talking about. So this is a very important trial, and it's a trial that we are well into, uh, and uh, we have uh, now uh, close to 1,600 patients already randomized. Now, uh, let me perhaps move on to uh, talking about where we stand with carotid artery stenting in 2020. To make sure that we had the best carotid artery stenting and the best endarterectomy to compare to this five-star medical therapy, we set about credentialing uh, CREST to stenting operators and surgeons who were going to be doing endarterectomy. Let me talk about the stenting operators. The committee, which was comprised of interventional cardiologists, vascular surgeons, 
neurosurgeons, neuroradiologists, neurologists, and uh, uh, other neurologists interested in the quality of the trial, then looked at the outcomes and the way certain interventional cardiologists and uh, carotid stenting operators, vascular surgeons, neurologists were performing the procedure. Very, very importantly, this was a quality assurance for carotid stenting. We have been able to credential now close to 200 operators in over 160 sites to many hospitals, community hospitals, academic centers, and uh, 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 smaller institutions around the country. And so we got a chance to look at how they were doing, not in the randomized trial where the outcomes are blinded, but we looked at the outcomes in the cases they were doing that they must submit to our registry. And of course, all of these cases are covered by full CMS reimbursement. So let me ask you a question. Where are we now with uh, the Crest 2 registry? Do you have any preliminary data that you could uh, discuss with us? Yes, let's look here at this uh, slide because this was the results of the operators uh, performing cases in this Crest 2 registry. Let me emphasize again, this is not the randomized trial results, but we looked at this very carefully. So let's begin by thinking about a patient where we come to our office with a very severe stenosis. And it's only severe stenosis that we're treating, greater than 70% narrowing. We have a choice of putting them on best medical therapy, which we do for every patient. That's a statin. That's very good blood pressure medicines. That's controlling their diabetes. That is uh, antiplatelet therapy. Then, then uh, we consider randomizing them to medical therapy or endarterectomy or stenting. But we looked at the patients that were not randomized, but were in this registry. And the outcomes that we saw from this very large number of operators are superior to anything which we have ever seen published from credible uh, prospective registries over the last 20 years. So the outcomes in asymptomatic patients were 1.4%. In symptomatic patients, 2.8%. Uh, even the best of any other revascularization technique that's done prospectively and rigorously uh, does not come up with better stroke and death outcomes in the periprocedural period. More interesting to me was when we looked at those patients who would have been eligible for the randomized trial, but for some reason lived remotely, didn't want to participate, just wanted to get the revascularization done. The stroke and death rate was 0.8%. So this was published in the uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology just a month ago. These demonstrate the safety of carotid stenting when performed by credentialed operators, of which there are many, and they include vascular surgeons and neurologists and neurosurgeons and radiologists, as well as interventional cardiologists throughout the country. But these outcomes are really uh, superior. And this, to me, uh, is telling me that uh, since we know that strokes are very rare after you do an endarterectomy or surgery, that we have a good chance of demonstrating in CREST 2 that uh, medical therapy may be, uh, it may be hard to beat revascularization, even with this very good medical therapy that we're putting the patients on in the other arm of the trial. Thank you, Gary. The results are very impressive. I, I'm quite convinced that this is one of the best results that we have seen so far with uh, carotid artery uh, stenting, particularly because 45% of those patients were symptomatic. So uh, another important issue is, uh, is there a cognitive decline associated with carotid artery stenosis? Is it only present uh, with symptomatic or can it be also present in asymptomatic patients? And also how does a carotid intervention uh, play a role in this uh, scenario? Can you comment on some of the, the information related to the CREST-2 trial? 
Yes, this is a great question. Thank you, Dr. Crazier, and one that's very important. The CREST-2 trial is state-of-the-art medical therapy and state-of-the-art revascularization with stenting or endarterectomy. They're really two separate trials, the endarterectomy and the stenting arm compared to medical therapy. One of the things we're looking at very carefully with cognitive testing of all the patients, including in a subset MRI imaging before and at follow-up, and cognitive testing and follow-up is to test whether removing these blockages is a, a, an important way to diminish cognitive decline that we've seen anecdotally in patients with high-grade blockages. That these, This slide shows uh, in light brown the cognitive status of patients who have had high-grade blockages and the cognitive status of patients who, dot, who do not have high-grade blockages, or have had the blockages removed. And this is in different domains. This is just one of a number of studies. And this is uh, what we would call preliminary evidence that there is a strong signal that perhaps removing the blockage, apart from preventing stroke, that it may improve cognitive decline. So this is another very important reason why we must recruit patients to the CREST-2 trial why we must complete this trial, because not only will we answer the question, is revascularization still superior to best medical therapy, as it was in the past? Is it still? And in addition, can we improve cognitive function in patients who are revascularized? So this is a very important issue for us to be discussing. Thank you, Gary. So um, to summarize, uh, scientific evidence as far as carotid interventions are concerned. And your personal experience, you've been doing this for more than two decades. Uh, what uh, is your approach uh, as far as treatment is concerned? Who are the candidates for carotid artery stenting in your experience and who are better candidates for carotid endarterectomy? Thank you, that's another very important question for all of us to be thinking about. In 2020, when a symptomatic patient who's had a stroke, or a, more commonly, uh, TIAs, transient ischemic attacks, when they present to us, the evidence is that we should take care of the blockage after we start them on this intensive medical therapy. And so what we do is we start them on statins, dual antiplatelet therapy. And then we look at the anatomy and Dr. Montero Baker has very nicely uh, pointed out that we have advanced imaging now. Many patients are suitable for a stent and a, quite a large number of patients, when we look at the anatomy, we uh, think that alternative techniques such as endarterectomy or a new technique called transcarotid uh, stenting, TCAR, is uh, the best option. So if it's a symptomatic patient, then we move them on to the best option, depending on their anatomy, as Dr. Montero Baker pointed out. Now for the asymptomatic patient, we're in a totally different ball game. For asymptomatic patients, we don't know whether we should revascularize immediately. Certainly we understand today that there is no emergency if someone's having no symptoms. And so for these patients, my practice, and what I think is the best current therapy is to approach these patients to be in the CREST-2 trial, where they have a 50-50 chance of getting either endarterectomy or surgery on one hand, or a 50-50 chance of continuing with the medical therapy, which we follow them very carefully. And should they have the worrisome symptoms, we can also move them on to revascularization. So in 2020, uh, my advice to all my asymptomatic patients is participate in the CREST-2 trial. This will give us so much information about how uh, to manage these patients going forward. It will give us the best scientific uh, evidence that we need to understand how to treat these patients. So Gary, this is as a follow-up question. I cannot resist not to ask you this question. A few months ago, uh, <clears throat> we had a uh, visiting physician, uh, Ann Abbott from Australia, visiting us and uh, actually we recorded a program with her. 
And uh, as you know, and you know her well, she adamantly uh, disagrees that uh, carotid artery stenting has any role for treatment of patients with cerebrovascular disease. So I ask her a very pointed question. I ask her, is there any role for carotid artery stenting in patients with severe carotid artery disease? And I said, even 99% stenosis of a patient that needs a urgent uh, cardiac surgery, and she said no. So uh, I want you to answer this on the basis of uh, scientific evidence. Uh, this is a rebuttal, and I think it uh, is appropriate for you as a leader in the field to give this statement. Well, that's a great question. I, I would say uh, that uh, some commentators have very strong opinions. Uh, I'm not sure that that necessarily makes their opinions correct. But in the area of high-grade carotid stenosis, there is now best evidence uh, from previous studies that revascularization is superior to medical therapy, and particularly for a patient that's undergoing the hemodynamic extremes of, for example, coronary artery bypass surgery, the standard of care is to take care of this lesion until we have scientific evidence to the contrary. And we do not have that. So if we fall back on the science, if we fall back on our experience and the work that we need to do, then the standard of care and the recommendation from uh, the vast, vast majority of those of us taking care of these patients is that revascularization is in order in these patients. And of course, uh, we are studying this very carefully in PRESS2, and we will have additional answers in a year or two when we finish that trial. So uh, that's my thoughts on that particular previous um, opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. I share your views. Well, this is very informative, and uh, <clears throat> I would uh, like to uh, thank uh, both of you gentlemen on your very valuable and meaningful and scientific contribution to Texas Heart Institute educational programs. Thank you very much. You're welcome.